This is episode number 30 of DevOps Paradox with Darren Pope and Victor Farsik. I am Darren. And I am Victor. Today we've got another guest with us. We have Matt Turner with us. Matt, introduce yourself, please. Hey, so I'm Matt Turner. Um, I am head of platform at Zigloo, which is a fintech startup in London. And my interests are around cloud native computing, Kubernetes, Istio, that kind of thing. Cool. And today's topic is the role of the SRE. So I guess, because Matt, you and I just met a few moments ago. Uh, I'm guessing you play part of the SRE role. Yeah, I think when we met, I was trying to explain what I do. And um, the answer is kind of everything because I'm on a small team. Um, but yeah, one of the ways I do describe that is as an SRE, a cyber reliability engineer. And certainly that's that's what I'm looking to hire for here. So, so this isn't a pitch, but... Um, no, it's you know, okay. I, you can pitch. Well, okay. I mean, if anybody's in London. Um, but no, it was more though, you know, when I got here, the the... the uh, CEO said, "Oh well, and we'll build a team around you. We'll we'll get in some DevOps people." And I said, "I think the word DevOps is is very very overloaded and often misunderstood now. And this is you know this has been talked about a lot. Um, but specifically, if you put DevOps engineer on a role spec, um, you that doesn't completely capture the kind of thing that, that that I was looking for. The kind of team I was trying to build here. I didn't think it really described what I was doing or what I needed help with. So I used you know SRE, I guess, in the sense that Google defined it with the SRE book." Yeah, so you just mentioned the word that strikes my nerve, kind of DevOps engineer. What is a DevOps engineer? Just kind of to clarify that. Well, I don't know, and I think that's why I, <laughs> that's why I don't like to use it. Um, you know, what is DevOps, right? Uh, we we could have this conversation again, um, but uh, you know, effectively, DevOps is a is a culture. It's a way of working. It's a way of a bunch of cross functional people coming together and doing something to me at least um so to, to put the you know the adjective devops on front of engineer and to look for a devops engineer is is almost a paradox ironically to me right it almost doesn't make sense because devops is about uh engineers with different sets of skills including now people with skills in modern infrastructures coming together and and working alongside back-end devs and front-end devs and trying to get um, something done together, you know, collaboratively more than the sum of their parts. So to say DevOps engineer, I think you're, you're just into uh, recruiters playing whack-a-mole with, you know, with buzzwords, right? And saying, oh, this person needs Jenkins and Kubernetes and Terraform and blah, blah, blah. And it's a set of skills and not necessarily a way of working, not a, an understanding. Okay, cool. Then we're in the same page. We'll continue being friends. I was just worried Does for Does it annoy you in the same way? Good, good, good. Yeah, no, no, because, you know, Usually when I meet people, they say, I'm a DevOps engineer. That means that I was managing Jira before and I'm still doing that, but now I'm not any more shared services. Now I'm DevOps engineer, right? Uh, so we're on the same page. Cool. I don't know where we were, but you can continue. <laughs> well, the, the one question I was going to ask is you talked about the SRE definition via Google, right? Or yes. What was, so why don't you explain that a little bit more too? Yeah, so I think DevOps was a slightly flippant, well, let's define SRE by, by what it isn't. Um, but that's not completely fair. There's, there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap, I'm sure, between people who would define themselves as that. Um, but I guess I'm specifically talking about um, the, the SRE book, um, Site Reliability Engineering. I think the first one's called, and then the second one is a more practical, it's called the Site Reliability, Site Reliability Engineering Workbook or something. And there's basically these two books that, that set out how Google runs production services, um, what the people do, what their skills are, what they work on, how they work, how they work with the rest of the teams. Uh, you know, I've, I've recently in my job here been setting some, some SLAs and some SLIs and some SLOs. And, you know, those are sort of point solutions, to, uh, technical and process solutions that, that we can go into. Um, but this book covers the whole range of uh, what does it mean to to engineer a a site for reliability you know what does it mean to work on the prod system what do you want it to be and how like reliable obviously performance secure etc and uh how do you get it there what skills do you need how do you apply them who do you work with it all seems so simple right easy peasy but uh do you apply the i cannot be working on fixing issues more than 50 percent as well for us, it's an aspiration because we're a small team. 
right? Uh, I can't I can't go to my director if if I'm spending more than fifty percent of my time on on toil, right? Which is the word they use to describe like, firefighting, essentially manual, repetitive work that you have to do to bail the ship out. Um, imagine bailing the ship out with a bucket versus, you know, fixing the motor, fixing the, the bilge pump that's going to do it for you. If anybody wants a sailing analogy, seems very Kubernetes related. Um, I can't go to my director and say, well, look, you know, we're all busy with our buckets. Could we just get another team in that, you know, that knows, knows motors to go and fix this bilge pump? Like we don't have that luxury here. Um, I'm sure in Google they do, but it's definitely an aspiration. You know, I think, um, to, to me, this is another way of looking at technical debt. So if I say, well, we're spending 80% of our time putting out fires, well, the question then is step back. Why is so much on fire? Why do I have so many fires to put out? Did I try to add too many features too fast? Um, did I just, was I just not skilled enough with what I was trying to do and I did a bad job? You know, what do I need to do to pay down that technical debt so we can then go forwards with less of an operational burden? And then spend more time doing, as you alluded to, the the fifty percent software engineering to to automate processes to build better systems for next time. So you're in financial sector, right? How do you how do how do you deal with policies and uh, you know all the all the restrictions that you're probably having there? Because you know when, when I speak with other financial institutions, it's usually kind of yeah, we cannot do this because of this policy and we cannot do that and basically we cannot do anything because everything is blocked in a way. Right. And I think, I, I do think to a certain extent some of that is self-imposed. Um, it's it's easier to make your regulator happy if you show them something they've seen before. But it might not be the correct strategic investment of your time you know, to build and operate a, a more legacy uh, less good system when you could actually put the time into building a more modern system, really understanding it yourself and then explaining it to, to the compliance people in a way that they understand it. But it is difficult, I mean, to take uh, a, a sort of central tenant of, of the SRE model, which is this idea of an error budget, right? So what is the appropriate quality for my system? If this is a, a free service, this is Santa Tracker, it's a nice, it's a nice free. So we must be due Santa Tracker pretty soon, uh, right? It's twentieth of November when we when we go to air. Um, but if you know, if I'm building Santa Tracker, that's great. But if it goes down, well, it's not revenue making. Nobody's probably going to pin the reputation of the company on it. So there can be um, there can be an appropriate level of quality that isn't a hundred percent. You know, isn't the mythical nine nines or whatever. Uh, so we can not take shortcuts, but we can take practical decisions that balance you know the rate at which we get features out the the modernity the the cutting edgeness of the technology versus the the ultimate availability we're going to get out of it um so we would set uh, uh an slo a service level objective so an objective for that for the level of service that says say this thing you know this thing is up two nines so 99 percent of the time it works one percent of the time it can be broken so there's an error budget there that says well you have one percent of the time it can be down and that's okay you know users have had their expectations managed to that degree and if you're not to the front end if you're some back end part of the system then your upstream services are are to expect that you're going to be down a certain amount of the time and they have to deal with it they have to throw a circuit breaker they have to time you out they have to return a default value or something now for the regulation for the compliance we can't have an error budget for that you know we have to we have to get it right we have to be compliant all the time uh, we have to we have to tick every box, and of course we can't ever lose people's money or their personal information. That's that's not right. Um, it, that's illegal and that's immoral, and we would never do that. Um, so it's it's interesting trying to kind of blend the two approaches. But it seems like by the time something hits your bucket for work, everything has to be right, right from from an SRE perspective. Things have been thrown over the fence to you. Is that a fair statement or not? Maybe not in today's world, but let's move back to a not so happy fintech world and back to big big bank world. Yeah, absolutely. In big banks, you know, things would be would be thrown over the wall. Um, probably, you know, sort of uh, transmitted upwards. You know, the uh, a release would be packaged as a as a jar, let's say. And sort of knowledge of that release would go up the hierarchy on the one side, on the dev side, and then across 
from project manager to project manager and then back down again to the poor guy that's got to, uh, or girl that's got to actually release the thing uh, into production. Um, and the, you know, the two type, you haven't even thrown it over the wall because you don't know where you're throwing it. You know, you're, the two sides are never talking to each other. And that leads to a whole load of perverse incentives. You know, that leads to the people in operations just saying, no, you know, it works now. Uh, why would I want the new version? Like, it's just work for me. It may, I have to do work to deploy it and it may be broken. So I may then have to do work to fix it. And I don't know what the new features are. I didn't write them. I have no investiture in them. I am a thousand degrees removed from the customer. So I don't feel the pain of them not having these new features. So you get all kinds of anti-patterns there and all kinds of perverse incentives. And I think that's what the nub of DevOps does actually mean, right? It says development and operations should work together and, um, Certainly in the SRE model, uh, the developers come to me and they say, right, we've got a new feature. We, we want to release this. We've pretty much tested it. though It may be broken, but we don't want to spend another week on it. We want to get it out there, see how it performs, see if users, you know, this is, this is agile, see if users even want it because there's no point us fixing the last few hard bugs if nobody's even going to click this button and use this feature. So, hey, will you operate this for us? Um, as I say, it crashes occasionally, but it's isolated to one microservice that, that you can just restart. The, here are the change logs in the things that are you know, upstream of it. Uh, and you can see that they just throw a circuit breaker. If this thing goes down, they just go, right, I'm going to use a default value and pretend that that service never existed. So I, I, you know, a, a working culture and a collaboration between dev and ops can really help you move a lot faster. So, so yes, now nobody chucks things over the wall to me. We, we talk about them. It's kind of did, did you just describe real conversations or do those conversations happen? They do, they do in my workplace. Uh, I mean, I describe real conversations because the the operations team and the development team fit in one room, right? And we all have wheelie chairs, so so that's nice and easy. Uh, I, I, and we don't have any remote team members yet. Um, these conversations can absolutely happen by pull request. So if, if you're familiar with the, the GitOps model, you know, the sort of change control by pull request kind of model, um, then a, a, like a pull request or a, or a change request is the ideal place for that to happen. So there would be, in the GitOps model, for people who don't know, there is a Git repo describing what the state of production should be. So for example, a Git repo full of Kubernetes YAML files saying, okay, I've got three microservices, you know, here's the de deployment YAML for the first one. It's this container image at this version. Here's the deployment YAML for the second one. It's this other container image at this other version and I want five copies of that. That's it's in a Git repo. The CD system watches that Git repo, uh, redeploys to production every time there's a change. So nobody ever goes and clicks through a CD system. Nobody ever shells into anything. You make your changes in Git and through the tooling, the automation then reflects that into production. So if I want to change what's in production, if I'm a dev who wants to release a new version of my software, I go and edit the YAML file you know, to bump the version of the container image. I do that on a branch and then I, I PR it. Uh, into master and because uh, you know that's operations owns that repo it's, it's our repo that feeds into our kubernetes cluster that i can see oh a dev wants to um you know bump this version number a, a dev wants to change a change an image and then i can have a conversation in the pr to say well i've looked at the the, the change list that this is associated with and i can't see that you've added any automated tests or you know i've, I've checked your build output and the test that you do have a failing that kind of thing so so is it then the the logic that everybody you own the re master branch but everybody can create a pull request is is that a fair statement i think that's one way to do it that's that, that, i mean that's the way we do it although as i say here the conversation would tend to happen in person first yeah. um th th there's a million ways to skin that cat i think it's the technical implementation is 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 an implementation detail. You know, if if you have a mono repo, then then who owns that repo? GitHub doesn't give you fine grained access controls. So do you use um, something like this? The the bot that Kubernetes has on their GitHub repo to to um, use these owners file to give more fine grained controls to GitHub? Do you just have a you know a process on an honor system? There's there's a million ways to do that. But I think what you need to look at is your is your organization and your lines of accountability and your communication structure and like who morally owns the thing you know who is who has the the right to make the changes to production who's responsible for that when it happens and it, it it probably is a case of whatever works for you and a lot of that depends on how automated the system is you know what i just described is probably the next stage for my small company 
Um, but you can take it much further than that. If you have a tool like Flagger from Weaveworks or if you, you know, any of these more advanced CI CD systems, it's safe for anybody to just go and, and change a version and say, I want version five in prod because it won't just get deployed to prod, it'll get deployed, you know, these kind of tools will deploy to a staging environment, they'll send it 1% of traffic, 5% of traffic, they'll roll it back if it errors. So you can do all of these based on this GitOps model, you can you can have all of these automated tools do the sort of canarying and the alert monitoring and stuff for you. Um, so it really is, it, you know, it's it's the classic, uh, again, I want to say SRE thing of, of automate where you can, you know, write tools to, to eliminate toil, eliminate manual work, eliminate risk, you know, you know the, the reason why I ask you the question is that I mean we are pretty much aligned. That's that's what what I've been teaching, preaching, and stuff like that. But still, I don't see those things being truly applied in, especially in, in financial industry, which is still on a level of, you know, your operations. I'm going to open seven Jira tickets, and then that's about it. Right, and nobody ever fired got, got fired for saying no, uh, and nobody ever nobody ever got fired for having three audit trails and five signatures on a sign off. Right, so yeah, it is a, it is a difficult balance. Um, I know we don't have all of the possible classes of banking license. You know, we're not up to the highest level because we don't do that kind of thing. Uh, I know there are some institutions around here that do. I, I don't know the the internals of their their systems. You know how they work or how they how they explain them to people. Um, but I think, you know, every, every corporation is going to have corporate governance as well. I've been, worked in some big, slow enterprises that you were, you would think were regulated. And really it's just paranoia and power structures and, you know, all of the classic things you get in big enterprises. And there's no, there's no external need for it. It's just something that's happened internally, you know, in the worst case by, uh, middle management trying to justify their jobs and build empires. And in, you know, in, in the best case by, people honestly having retrospectives and having these these you know outage um uh, sort of reflection meetings where there is an error we say okay what happened what was the root cause what process are we going to put in place to stop that happening again but then for each one of these you put a different process in place and even though you know then 20 years on you have 20 years worth of of sort of paranoia and gates right and a lot of them just aren't applicable anymore a lot of them were for a thing that happened once because we got really unlucky and we we probably didn't need to put a process around it or for something that happened 20 years ago and couldn't happen now because that whole system's been deleted or it doesn't work like that anymore but these big enterprises just accrete these layers and layers and layers of controls in the same way that you know I'm going to go out on a limb and say a lot of the financial regulation, or at least the interpretation of it, is that, uh, you know, combination, that, that combination of, of people having added a lot of stuff and never sort of stepped back and, and thought about what they could take away. That's, I mean, that's my two pence, right? I'm not here to tell you that the whole, whole system of financial regulation is broken and we should change it. But uh, um, like, like, like in every budget is, how acceptable is it to go wrong? I think on the sort of compliance side, you have to say, what do we actually need to do and why and what is the the minimum viable way sufficient of course um but the um minimum way in which we can show that we meet that but you know you know i, I believe that the cause the root cause of the problem in many institutions is that because of those layers that you were you just mentioned is that nobody really knows what are the regulations nobody has a clue it's just that there are 57,000 rules that you need to follow. We have no idea why anymore. Kind of that, that was lost somewhere sometime. And exactly. all I know is that, I, that uh, if, if I remove this thing, I will get fired if it fails. And I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> or you, you know, or the rules say you must have a firewall and it must be turned on. So the auditor says, point to your firewall. And I say, well, everything's in the cloud and it's actually Calico and Istio network policies. And they say, you're not compliant. And we kind of look at each other. All the, the regulation is very abstract and it says, well, you know, services must be isolated from each other on the network. And then you, you get an auditor who has only ever seen firewalls because everybody used them and says, you know, point to the box that's got one of the well-known brand names on the front. And you say, well, we're in the cloud and it's Calico and Istio network policies. Uh, and, uh, you know, you don't have a shared language to have that conversation. 
yeah, it's 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 difficult stuff. But I think it's what SRE culture and uh, if we're going to let ourselves use the term DevOps, has kind of fixed in another arena, right? Where Dev and Ops were talking a completely different language. Um, Dev was saying, well, we're agile now. We've got Scrum. We just want to add features and add features. We want to get them out there. We want to test them. You know, it doesn't matter if they, if you press a button and the app crashes, we don't care. It's not about the functionality. It's about the fact that users even try to press the button. And if we have two weeks of the user pressing the button and it crashing, then that's great because we know the user wants to press that button. So we'll go and fix the code behind it later. Um, and if you, you know, if you've got a, a brave product manager who's taken the decision that that's okay, that that's a, a reasonable user experience, uh, and that you know users' expectations have been managed, that this is a free app and it's like a beta and this is the kind of thing you can expect to happen, then that's great. But as an operations person, I you know, whose whose career has been around keeping things up and secure and performant and stable for as long as possible, I sort of look at that and cringe. Um, yeah, my language would tend to be. Where's the tests? You know, what's the resiliency? What's the failover plan? How do I, how do I detect failures as fast as possible? How do I recover from failures as fast as possible? You know, what's the availability story? What's the data integrity story? Uh, we, you just have these, these overlapping conversations in completely different languages. So that, you know, the sort of DevOps as a very broad movement has brought those together. And what I really like about what Google released in the SRE book is, of course, the fact that they've taken a very practical data-driven approach to that and said, right, sit down and talk about an error budget. Talk in terms of SLIs and SLOs and SLAs, and here are what these things mean. And here's an example for how you might even write one. So, but, you know, those conversations are, at least in my experience, extremely complicated with devs because, let's face it, they don't understand what you just said, right? I mean, not 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 in your case. I'm not I'm not saying in your company, but generally speaking, maybe. But then I, you know, I don't understand a lot of what they say. I, I used to be a software engineer myself, but I'm kind of five years out of date now. Um, so if somebody says, "Oh, don't worry," you know, the system, uh, the data integrity is always guaranteed because we, uh, you know, we we event source. You know, this is CQRS. We've got a big append only log of events, and then we, you know, we read them into several different systems that cast several different like read projections for the same data. I sort of have to scratch my head and go and read a few blog articles to understand what they mean because software engineering has moved on since my days of of big transactional relational databases and, and ORM systems and yeah our backups frankly. Um, so, but I've gone and learned that stuff. I do understand that stuff now. I've done a couple of toy projects and I, I kind of get what they're getting at. So a lot of it I think is just about a, a lot of it is I, I hate the phrase full stack engineer and I hate I almost hate the phrase T-shaped engineer, but a lot of it is about at least appreciating a wider set of job roles and a wider set of tools and, and knowing enough to be able to engage people in conversation and at least to say, right, I know I know roughly what you're getting at and I trust you to be an expert in that domain. You know, how can I help? Can we can we bring ourselves together enough so that we can have a conversation and work out what we both need to go off and do? Does does that make sense? Oh yeah. So I mean, is, is, isn't that kind of the, the the objective, the goal behind urging people to be T-shape? Kind of, obviously, nobody can be specialized in everything, but if I don't have a knowledge of high level of everything, then we cannot speak realistically, right? Right. And I guess the, you know, the old fashioned conceit was that you would have a manager who would be that communication conduit for you because the manager, you know, had done all of the technical jobs and could still do all of the technical jobs. And you remember for, for ages, companies were trying to, they were either promoting their best engineers into management, which was bad, uh, or they were trying to hire these people, you know, oh, you need to be a senior engineer plus the following management skills because we need somebody with with credibility who's been there and done done it, somebody who the engineers will respect. And I think that's completely wrong, right? I think that's that's not my idea of what a software engineer manager should be at all. Um, so yeah, maybe it is better that the we're now encouraging the engineers to uh, to become more T-shaped and to understand that stuff. On the other hand, you know, I I'll say it. I hate the idea of I hate full stack. I, I think the subtlety there is that nobody can be an expert in everything. I think you can be an expert in one thing and appreciate some other things, and that's maybe T-shaped. But this idea that you know, yeah, a full stack developer is just somebody who can do JavaScript front end and back end, right? Um, 
the idea that you've got somebody who really knows Vue.js and can keep up to date with all the latest stuff and knows Kubernetes and can keep up to date with all the latest stuff and can write a high performance, resilient distributed system in Go is probably a bit of a fallacy. Certainly my brain's not big enough to, to probably do one of those things, let alone three. Um, so yeah, I think this, this whole movement has forced us to, to look again at, at, even right down to even job roles and, you know, and career progression It's your career. I started off doing embedded C and my career progression was l learn more about C, learn more about the, the architectures, you know, be able to write better C from knowing all of the language and the tooling, be able to write high, higher performance code by understanding the architectures and the embedded chips more. And it was definitely a, you know, a very vertical, just become more and more of a, of an expert in this thing. And now I think the world is changing into, you know, right, you come here, you hit the ground running by being able to do one thing, but you become more useful by being able to collaborate with other teams by learning a little bit about what they do and being able to sit with them and help them out. Or, you know, maybe that's just sample bias for me. Maybe maybe other people have got different experiences. You know, it matches my my experience as well. And to be honest, I, I, I feel your pain about... If assuming that I understood what you wanted to say about uh, full stack, to me, kind of full stack is okay. So you're capable of making a hobby website. Uh, now, 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 tell me what you're gonna learn for real, in a way. Yeah. Which, which is, I think, being full stack is useful because you understand a couple of segments of the system, and I think that that's very, very useful. Uh, but still comes the time when you need to really learn something for real. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that everybody should be full stack up to a level so that they understand the database and then the front end and back end. But then, then comes the moment you really need to learn something in more detail. Yeah, I, th I think understanding, you know, what a relational database can do for you the fact that there are foreign key constraints, right? So that you don't have to do all of your integrity checking in code because you can leave them to the database. You know, what a transaction is and how we can use those. Uh, and then on the front end, you know, I, I know roughly what model view controller is. I know that React and Vue use the sort of, uh, you know, flux redux pattern for data storage. And then that, you know, how how that translates to sort of a model of view and a controller. And then, I, you know, I, this, this controller does... Um, your data manipulating, uh, you know, CRUD requests to the back end, and then that's 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 bound to some views on the front end. Having that sort of fifty thousand foot block diagram in your head does, I think, help you design these um, these back end systems, right? Because then I look at the the infrastructure that I'm building, and I say, right, well, these requests are going to be coming in through my Istio ingress gateway. If the line's a bit choppy, then I'm going to want to uh, maybe retry requests on behalf of the of the user. Um, you know, and it sounds obvious, but yeah, HTTP gets can I can retry them on behalf of the user because they should be a, they should be uh, read only, they should be idempotent, they shouldn't have any side effects on the data store. Whereas a like a, a post request coming from the front end should, and just having that kind of understanding where I can meet people in the middle and we have this shared language for the semantics of our system, I think that's useful. Wait, now now you're confusing me. You just describe yourself as being a senior full stack developer. <laughs> I really didn't. <laughs> I honestly didn't. I think I describe myself as having enough knowledge to be dangerous. <laughs> let's, let's rephrase it. He, he defined himself as how a recruiter would define a CFL stack <laughs> yes. developer. Yeah. Matt, Matt has heard of the following technologies. <laughs> Therefore, Matt is worth $1,000 a day. Yeah. And I think that's broken because people respond to incentives, right? Everybody wants a better job. Recruiters are, well, I guess I can't swear on your podcast, so I won't say anything about recruiters. Um, but, you know, this is this has been happening forever. You know, have, have we made it any better with our um, with our T-shaped engineers and our DevOps? I don't know. Are we reinvent? I'm, I'm, in, I'm getting old now. Like, are we just reinventing the same problems? Like, maybe we are. Well, I am old. And yes, we are reinventing the same problems. Right. Um, I actually wanted to get, I've been quiet over here the whole time listening. I actually have one question. Is there ever a case to where GitOps does not work? Um, or should not work? Either, either one is okay. 
I mean, have you ever been hands on with this, Victor? Did you want to? Did you want to talk about this? I mean, the only case where it doesn't work that I can imagine is where team is so messed up that simply you cannot expect them to do that. But ignoring people's complete lack of knowledge how to do things better, which unfortunately happens very often. So, if 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 you exclude lack of abilities to do things. I cannot imagine how GitOps, a scenario in which GitOps would not work. I mean, it, it's pretty easy for me to define it. Kind of, everything is defined as code. Yes, code is stored in Git. Yes, therefore Git operates, initiates operations. Yes, I, I cannot imagine a situation in which it doesn't. It doesn't work. Right. Well, that's the reason why I was sort of, I was posing it towards Matt because number one, he's in a FinTech, it's a smaller team. So right now the foundation has been built to be GitOps only. Is that a, that's a question I'm assuming the answer is yes. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, There are some, there are some practical shortcuts at the moment, but, but yeah, Yeah. that's definitely what I'm shooting for. Okay. Um. I, I, I guess I'd say a couple of things. I, I have a sort of cautionary tale from a couple of weeks back where I needed to do something real fast. So I didn't have time to, uh, you know, first of all, write out the declarations of what I wanted. And then, of course, you know, you have to, to do these GitOps systems, you actually have to synchronize the Git repo with the real world. So there's some Terraform in the Git repo. And then, you know, through magic that appears in the cloud provider when we do a pull request. There's Kubernetes YAMLs and Istio YAMLs and through other magic because they're diff- they're a different for file format and they're uh, deployed to a different system. So through other magic, they appear in production when I change them. And there was like a fourth type of thing where, that we wanted in Git and then to magically appear in production. So you actually need to do, you actually need to build quite a lot of stuff to make that happen. Uh, and ideally you want a kind of diffing engine afterwards. So ideally you want the sort of GitOps operator that looks at Git and then makes it happen in production. And then to make sure, you know, that makes sure, that makes sure that production is at least what's described in Git. And really, especially if you want to be compliant, especially if you're worried about security, you need to make sure that that's everything that's in, in production, right? The production contains nothing else that isn't described in Git because that means it's been manually put there either, either, you know, accidentally or maliciously. So you need some kind of diffing agent that's going to run and you want alarms from that. So there is quite a lot of work to do. And a few weeks ago, I was given, you know, a task that had to happen very quickly. So I just did it manually. I literally just clicked and ran some command line arguments. Um, so that then left me with something in prod and I wanted it described in Git. You know, I wanted to get to the point where I could run our deployment thing and have it say, oh, nothing to apply. You know, we're, we're, we're in sync. But backing, it's kind of going backwards, writing the, the stuff to declare what I'd manually brought up in a way that exactly matched it so that I didn't have to, because I, because it was, it was live, right? I'd manually just done it and then it was live and I couldn't take it down. So I, I couldn't just go and write the declarations and think they were pretty close and then take the production system down and just, you know, remake it from Git because there would have been some downtime. So I had to get it exactly right. And I had to have the, uh, this was Terraform. So I had to do a lot of Terraform import and a lot of Terraform state renaming to, to massage Terraform's internal state that it uses to track this stuff, uh, in order to, to make it think that it had made the stuff in production in order to, to make it convinced that they were going to match up, but it didn't want to make any changes. And that took a very, very long time because that required a deep, deep understanding of how Terraform works, like how it internally manages its state. And it just, but yeah, doing that backwards just took, took a very long time. Um, so I guess there's the one cautionary tale there of this is great if you're Greenfield and if you've got the time and the space and if everything, you know, if nothing's ever on fire, um, it's, you're quite a long way removed from the real world. So it's, it's can be very tricky when you start trying to break the glass, I guess. Um, I guess the only other thing I would say is that it's, it depends how you interpret GitOps. And I'm sure, you know, if you, if you read the sort of WeaveWorks material on this, it's a lot better than I can explain it. But my original naive thinking was, oh, well, I get something in Git and then I go like bang, make it in production. And of course, that's probably not quite what you want. A, a common counter argument is, well, you need a, there's some, for, for some things, you need a workflow engine. So imagine, for, I, I assume most people have used Kubernetes by this point, you know, imagine the sort of vulnerable uh, deployment resource. 
So I make a deployment that says I want 10 pods Nginx version one. And then I change that YAML to say I want 10 pods Nginx version two, and I apply it. Kubernetes doesn't just delete the 10 version one pods and make 10 version two pods, because that would give us downtime. It doesn't make the 10 version two pods and then delete the 10 version one pods, because that uses a huge amount of memory and, and you're still doing a big uh, sort of all at once change over to version two. And maybe version two is broken. So what it does is it it sees that change has happened, the the intent from having version one to the intent of having version two, and it does a rolling update. You know, it'll take one version one pod down and put a version two pod up, and it'll then wait to see if it starts correctly, wait to see if it passes three health checks, and only if it does will it then take the next version one pod down and put the next version two pod up. And if any point the health checks start to fail during that rollout, um, then it'll sort of it'll stop. Um, so, th so that I guess is is an example of sort of an active piece of code, the, the kind of thing you might have done with a with a Jenkins file or with a help, you know, even a Bash script or Apache Airflow or one of these sort of workflow engines like a state machine. Um, Kubernetes does that for for deployments based on a you know a, a one line all or nothing change in the config, and you quite often find that you need those things. You know, maybe I bring up a whole nother cluster at a new version and I, I deployed my a copy of my entire application stack to it um, and then I want to just move traffic at like a CDN you know at the Cloudflare, Cloudflare level I want to just move traffic across one percent at a time um, that kind of thing you know we used to do with there'd be a hundred Jira tickets right and well you know some some poor person in the network operations center in the middle of the night would be like one more percent you know count to 10, check it's not on fire, one more percent, or you'd have a Perl script to do it. So now that can be automated. Uh, and that kind of uh, imperative, you know, side effect having workflow thing is quite often needed. So, so I think the idea of GitOps is completely sound, but it's not a magic bullet. You often need these. And this is where, you know, the, the fashion for writing, everybody's writing three Kubernetes operators a day at the moment. That fashion has kind of come in because you, you, you often need that like imperative control. Yeah, so, you know, I have a very loose definition of GitOps to me kind of, ultimately what I really care is that whatever you did somehow ended up in Git. Not necessarily that Git needs to operate absolutely everything, but kind of, okay, you run a script, at least you can put the script in Git. Please, kind of, please, pretty please, no? Okay, so I, th yeah, I think I've seen a slightly stricter definition than that, where, where Git is the source of truth. And of course, if you write a script, you should source control it, right? I mean, yeah, of course, it should be under version control. Um, but this is more about having you know configuration as code and having that configuration in one place and it's it's git first so the change is only the change is approved through the pr process or whatever process you need to get stuff onto the right branch in git and it only you know, then it is real it, it's only real when you've got it into git and then it is very real because an auto as soon as it's in git an automated system will start to deploy it i will try to get production in into sync with git asap and that makes git because git is your single source of truth and your only source of truth then git is the, the git log because git's a merkle tree i mean it looks quite a lot like a sort of blockchain if you look at it in the right way that is then your your audit trail no no and i completely agree with that and 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 i do believe that that's the right thing to do but there's i think that we're going towards the same point is that yes sometimes you need to take um shortcut right uh, like what you did but at least let's kind of so if 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 you're gonna circumvent the whole process and then do something without it at least you can store it in git if not let the git uh, be your full definition no right and i think yeah i think that's just good software engineering right i think that's just professionalism and i did for you know for this change i I did click for a couple of things, but mostly, you know, I I called the CLIs for various things. So I did write that into a into a batch file, into a into a bash script, uh, and I put it in Git so that if I went under a bus, at least there was a record. And then, you know, the next sort of painful week I had of trying to reconcile these systems, I I managed to I 
use the tooling that we already had, I could bring up a complete copy of our environment with Terraform because I'd had the time to do that properly. So with one command, I had a complete copy of the environment. I then ran this script against it to get you know another copy of the sort of manual hack. And then in that environment where it was safe, I was able to try to backfill the Terraform, run, you know, run Terraform apply, see what the diffs were. So I, you know, I took an, even then I took a, like a decision to the acceptable level of quality. Now, what you described is something that I don't see often in practice. People talk about it, but I don't see kind of that. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I interpret it kind of like you took a shortcut, took you, I don't know, an hour, half uh, minutes, whatever, it, to fix the system. And then you spent days, let's say, recuperating the depth, paying off the depth, right? And that is something that... I don't believe happens often that, you know, when people are faced with the tremendous amount of time that you need to to invest in to recuperate the debt, they usually give up, kind of. It's not worth it. I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm, I'm saying it is, but... But it doesn't happen. No, I mean, I've seen that as well. And I think that is where it's useful to point to... You know, if the if this caused outages in the service, so this was a debt in the infrastructure. This was a this was a debt in the management of the infrastructure, right? Which is even harder to qualify. Um, if we take it, if I'd taken a shortcut in the app, and yeah, it worked, and it was up. Well, it was it was out there and released, but it was crashing quite a lot. Then I'm able to point to the you know to the error budget and say, look, we said we'd have four nines of reliability. With, a, with an error budget to let us move fast. Well, we move fast, but we're going to spend all our error budget this quarter and we're going to go, we're going to blow through it. So you, you then, it's no longer like a, a heuristic, like an aesthetic finger in the air where some manager says, Oh, this is bad. The, the dev, why has the dev team done a bad job? And then some other manager says, Oh, it's good enough. Now you've now sat down and you've been forced to, to quantify, to put a number on it and you monitor that number and you say there can no longer be any, um, uh, you know, emotional decisions about whether this is good enough, you know, does it meet the number that we agreed on or not? Uh, so, but you're now able to do that for, for sort of apps and even for backend services, you know, one team says, look, we're having a hard time because something upstream we call is crashing all the time. And it, we're just having to put in loads and loads of code to deal with that and to work around it. You can then go to, the, the, to that upstream service and say, no, you, you have an agreement that says you will give us three nines and we're not getting it. And here's our measurement of that. Um, you're right, it becomes even more difficult for, for something I'm describing. But it, you know, the one thing I guess I can point at is the 50-50 you know, software engineering versus toil uh, thing that SREs are meant to aim for. And although we have to be a bit fast and loose with that here, I can say, look, if we carry this debt forwards, every time I have to touch this system, I'm going to have to remember what I did, You know, do a bit of GitOps, run this script on top of it, do a bit more GitOps. It's all a mess, and I'm going to, I'm going to forget one day, and I'm going to make a mistake. So I'm at way more than 50% of my time dealing with this, You know, doing toil, walking through manual run books that I've written to remind myself all the hacks I did. So again, I do have something to point to. Um, but equally, I just, you know, I just said, right, this is, this is happening. I am going to fix this debt. Uh, and I kind of asserted that I was going to do that. I asked for forgiveness rather than permission. Um, and, you know, and not to pitch. I have a, I have a very good CTO who was like, yep, absolutely understand. You know, thank you for working a couple of late evenings and getting it out there. Now you can get yourself back on track. You know, sorry, we did that to you. Next time there will be better planning around, uh, you know, giving everybody enough runway to not have to take those kind of shortcuts. And when, you know, let's have a retrospective and work out where the process failed us all. Cool. Uh, we're at about 43 minutes. Um, do you feel like we've talked about everything that could ever be talked about with SRE? No. No. Okay, good. But we, but we may revisit this one again another day, just not today. Exactly. Right? Okay. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the book about monitoring, about um, yeah, really all kinds of stuff. It's, very, it's all very interesting. You know, I'm always impressed by uh, seeing cool stuff in practice. Kind of, people usually talk about doing stuff. Everybody's doing DevOps. Everybody's doing SRES uh, stuff like that. But then you poke around it, and that's not true. So, I'm always really, really impressed when I 
hear somebody really doing it and especially that you're in financial industry that's um, yeah, really cool I, I think by saying what you run into on a day-to-day -day basis helps everybody out it's one thing as a vendor with who victor and i work for to say things but when you actually have a real pr practitioner day-to-day -day practitioner tell people something else let's put it this way your sessions at, at a conference are going to be packed more than a vendor session. Okay. <laughs> My KubeCon session actually is uh, I'm literally just debugging Istio. I lost like a day to Istio because it had a weird edge case. And I'm just going to, I'm literally just going to run through that again because I was, I was sat on a plane next to somebody from CNCF, like ranting about it one day. And they were like, please submit that to KubeCon. Because I had this idea for, you know, as some hobby project I'd done that used all the latest tech and I thought was really cool. Like I automated my, part of my house. And they were like, no, just tell us about the debugging session. Exactly, because that's real. Everybody can speak about pet projects. Everybody has a pet project. Right. Some of them, I mean, mine are cool though. I mean, mine are really, <laughs> but no, and yeah, I know what you mean. So, Matt, if people wanted to follow you, where's the best place to find you? Twitter? LinkedIn? Yeah, Twitter's probably the place where I guess I uh, aggregate everything. Um, I've got a, a Twitter, at MT165, which is my uh, my uni, uni user ID. That's a, a common thing people do over here in Britain. Um, so, yeah, I guess we can put that in the episode notes or something. I do have a website where there's links to all of the talks I give with the slides and any video if the conference takes it. So, I mean, Victor and I recently caught up at, at Code Motion Milan. Uh, I'll put a page up for that uh, that talk when they release the video. That was quite an in-depth Istio talk. Um, so that'll go up there. But, I, I, yeah, I, I, I tweet most of those things as I release them. So that's the place to, to catch up. Cool. We'll make sure links are in the notes for that as well. Now, uh, you said you are hiring right? We are. Okay. So just make sure to send me the links and we'll make sure the links off to your place. If people are in the London area now, right now you do no remote work. You need to be in London proper, correct? Yeah. We're building, we're trying to build a culture and we're trying to build a team. And, um, obviously the platform team has a lot of two. We're in the design phase as much as the build phase at the moment. So that has to be high communication. And we do work very, very closely with the back end of the front end team. So uh, I know I think all of that's great, but the flip side is, is yeah, people need to be central London uh, financial district. Okay, cool. So I also have a link for that uh, down in the show notes as well. And uh, if you have any questions or comments about this episode, you can reach out to us on the Slack team DevOps 20. That's DevOps the number two and the number zero. You can sign up for a free account and join the podcast channel or any of the channels. doesn't really matter. Uh, if you want to ask us a question, you can leave us a voice message using Voxer. You can sign up for a free, sign up for a pre, one, two, three. You can sign up for a free personal account. It's still Monday. Oh, wait, no, it's Tuesday when we're recording this. See, exactly. It's one of those weeks already. It is. And the time zones. You at the U.S. has changed time zone and we haven't. No, no it's the other way around. around. It's the other way around. You see how confused I am about it? I and I'm not even, and I'm not even in the U.S. right now, which is a whole another problem. Even though I'm still in the same time zone. Oh, other man. conversation. Uh, that is a whole other conversation. I, uh, yeah, this is the only time I've ever missed a flight was in this weird window where the uh, one time zone had changed and the other hadn't, and I hadn't changed my wristwatch. And I, um, I made this podcast as as you guys could attest, but yeah, it confused the hell out of me. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Okay. Let me try the Voxer thing one more time. You can sign up for a free personal account at Voxer. You can add DevOps Paradox as a contact and leave us a message. If you're listening via Apple Podcast, I was just checking out the notes today. Of course, this is coming out on November 20th. We're recording today is, uh, I don't know what, to, October 29th. Uh, we were number two in Estonia for the technology podcasts. <laughs> Estonia is a very cool place. Estonia. Yeah. But well, well, a couple of weeks ago, we were number one overall in Latvia. Right. So it's just one of those things. Anyway, so if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving a rating review and also click that sub subscribe button. Uh, because if you're listening this far, you probably need to subscribe anyway, because you're hearing all the weird stuff at this point. Uh, there are links to the Slack workspace, the Voxer account, and how to leave a review in the description of this episode. Also, we'll have, make sure we have links to Matt and his company. Uh, we've also added in some new links to uh, if you're on LinkedIn and you want to connect with us on LinkedIn. There's a, a link off to both mine and Victor's LinkedIn. Um, 
Victor, you're just going to be quiet. Matt, I'm going to leave you with the final words today. Oh, you put me on the spot now. Yeah. Okay. So just, all right. So we've talked to SRE for basically the past 45 minutes. If you're not, if your company thinks you're doing SRE, how can you prove that you're not? That's a good point. Uh, I would say to anybody who thinks they're doing SRE or DevOps in air quotes to, to get a copy of the Google SRE book. None of these ideas are really mine. You know, I, I put them into practice and hopefully talking about the practical implementation of them has helped people. Uh, but the, the site reliability engineering book from Google is fantastic. I think everybody should read it cover to cover. Uh, and then you will have a much better understanding of, of certainly what I go for here and what I think most people should be aiming for. And in the journey through that, you will see, especially the things about certain formats of documents and certain communication lines that should be open and, and things that you can quantify, things that you can be really explicit about and measure. Um, those are super valuable and you'll probably find that you're not doing those. You have this, this loose idea of a culture, which may be great and may be guiding you in the right direction, but most people I think can take it further with some real data driven management of this kind of stuff. There you have it, people. If you don't have the books, there's also links down to the uh, landing page that has links off to both the SRE book and the SRE workbook. Uh, yeah, yeah, the SRE book is freely available on the line now, I think. Oh, it is. Okay. I believe the, the book number one is. Cool. I didn't click through that far. But anyway, the links are out there. And I guess come see my talk at KubeCon is the last thing I'll say. But all... But only if you have at least a year of experience with the Istio, then otherwise you would not <laughs> understand it. Is that this is a different talk? This is a different talk. To a the different one. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You will need a bit of experience. I, I think I'm on the Wednesday of KubeCon in San Diego, which is the second day. I should be over my jet lag by then. Uh, I put my money where my mouth was and run Istio in production uh, here at Zigloo, and one day I. I misconfigured it. I set one configuration option that was incompatible with another. You might think Istio would uh, warn you about that. It doesn't. Equally, I shouldn't have made the mistake. So I just lost a day to this system not complaining, but not working. I finally got to the bottom of it, but I'd, I'd taken a tour through every debug tool in every part of the system to get there. So in 30 minutes, I'm going to try to, to go through that. Um, and to be honest, if I cut the swearing out, which is what I spent most of my day doing, I think I can get through it. So that should be a fun talk. Yep. So this episode releases on the same day that you're doing your talk. So <laughs> you if go. you've listened to this episode all the way to this point, go to run. the talk today. Run to the hall. Yeah, I, I would really like to... I would really like to find a person who is at the KubeCon and then listening to our podcast. Yes, because if you're there, Victor is there as well. So look for Victor. I don't know. Victor probably has a sticker, right? I don't know. We should, we should give him one. You have you somewhere. He probably has an adult beverage in his hand if it's after all the sessions. <laughs> yes. During absolutely. as well, but I will be hiding. And th think of us. I'm, I'm sat here in London. It's about five Celsius, which you'd probably call what mid forties Fahrenheit. It's raining. I'm looking forward to San Diego. Should be uh, sun and sun and. Isn't that weather. normal? But that's normal weather in the UK, right? It is normal weather in the UK. Well, yeah, then, which okay. is why I'm super excited about going to San Diego. Okay, are we all done now? I think so. Victor, you're done. Matt, you're done. Thanks again to you for listening to episode number thirty of DevOps Paradox.